So we are off to my GES, my gastric emptying study at the hospital, finally. <laughs> parking it took six minutes to be exact which is actually pretty good considering it's a smaller hospital and the parking lot is smaller so sometimes it take, takes us forever we had 20 minutes to find parking in case it took that long but thankfully it didn't so I'm so parched already from being NPO and not being able to run my IV fluids so fingers crossed that I'll be able to hold out my heart is racing um, for my pots being flared without my IV fluids, but I couldn't run my IV fluids because they want me to take a break on Liquids and foods and all I guess the IV fluids was considered a liquid. So Let's do this Is that a magnolia? No, it's not a magnolia
got that over with. It was not easy, but it's all over and done with. And we're just going to ignore the fact that I don't have any more eyeliner on my right eye because my eye was watering and really, really irritated all day. So it wore off, but I might put it back when I get in. Maybe. Hey guys, how's it going? It has been a couple days, actually a few days, since my gastric emptying study. I needed a few days to process and yeah, just rest because I was so exhausted physically and mentally after that, especially because the night before I had pain insomnia and slept literally two hours the night before. And in general, my sleep has been really rough. I no longer am taking gabapentin and since I stopped that, my sleep is mainly disturbed by my nerve damage because I have horrible neuropathy, which is just so painful. And even though I'm on amitriptyline, the pain often keeps me up most nights. So between that and my breathing, my allergies, my back pain, my stomach pain and nausea, it's just night times are the worst. So I've needed a lot of sleep the last few days. I'm feeling a little better today and I'm wearing my one of my favorite shirts, my yellow sunflower shirt. I really needed to be cheered up after getting the news that I got from my gastric emptying study. And you know, colors actually have the ability to affect our moods. I'm sure most people know that, but so I just love yellow, it's really cheery, and sunflowers are just a great reminder to always look on the bright side and to stay strong and keep your chin up no matter what. So yeah, wearing my sunflower shirt. I wanted to talk a little bit about why I needed the gastric emptying study in the first place. So this is actually a test I've needed for years because me and my team has suspected that I have gastroparesis for quite a long time. I have had GI symptoms since I was about seven or eight every day. It kept me out of a lot of school and it was always an issue. I kind of just dealt with it until my mid twenties when it just became debilitating. By the time I was 24, I was throwing up and having nausea every day. So not just stomach pain, bloating, nausea, vomiting, vomiting up undigested food hours after eating, burping, acid reflux. Sometimes I get heartburn, but not as often and just really bad stomach pains, no matter what I eat or drink, even if I, don't drink, I'm in pain, but if I eat or drink, the pain and nausea gets much worse, and I really almost never can hold food down unless I have my medical marijuana or oil, my CBD oil. Most of my treatments that I have tried over the years, which I'll maybe get a little more into later, have not helped, so it's been really rough to say the least, and I've lost a lot of weight. There was a period of time where within a month, I lost 30 pounds. That's a lot for a gal my height. I didn't have 30 pounds to lose. At my lowest, I was 85 pounds, and I am now, I'm not gonna say what I am, but I am very underweight. If I lose a few more pounds, I'll be in the 80s again, I'll be in the danger zone. I have a diagnosis of cyclic vomiting syndrome. I've had this symptom since I was about eight years old. I've gone through cyclic vomiting spells, and I do have some triggers like MSG, stress, foods with histamine, if I eat too many foods with histamine, like chocolate, I don't drink alcohol and I haven't drank for years, but that used to be a trigger of mine. There's a lot of things that I haven't been able to, like I haven't been able to figure out all my triggers. It happens pretty much all the time, so it seems like I don't even have to have a specific trigger, but now we know why. I've also been diagnosed with intestinal dysmotility, which means my intestines does not move food along properly, and my stool often just sits there and creates severe constipation. I am on the highest dose now of Linzest to help me with that, and I cannot go to the bathroom without taking medication every day like Linzest. I have been diagnosed with gastritis from an endoscopy that I had years ago. My GI actually thought about ordering another endoscopy, but since she already saw that I have gastritis and some inflammation, she didn't want me to go through another endoscopy because I have Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, and that can be really hard on an EDS body. I did have a really bad experience waking up in the middle of my endoscopy the last time I had one and it was awful to have a tube down your throat and not be able to talk and it was terrifying. They were like holding me down and you know trying to get me to fall back asleep with anesthesia and I was just, I was awake and it was miserable so I do not want to go through that again. I've had colonoscopies which just showed IBS which to me that's just a term they give people when they don't really know exactly what's going on. 
I guess the intestinal dysmotility and cyclic vomiting wasn't enough for them. They thought that there was something else like physical going on, like an obstruction. So eventually my gastroenterologist who ordered the gastric entering study, I had to see a new one this year when I got a new plan because for years my Medicaid plan didn't even cover a gastroenterologist, which is a whole nother issue in its own. I actually stayed in the hospital a few times for gastric flare-ups, for vomiting and stuff like that. And when I stayed in the hospital, I was throwing up for weeks and horrible diarrhea, which normally I'm constipated, but that time I had diarrhea, which is part of the reason I, end up, I ended up severely dehydrated. And I ended up going into hypovolemic shock because I have POTS. So I actually had to go to the ICU briefly for that. And I was okay, but I could have died. It got so bad. So that's another risk about in all the GI symptoms is it affects my POTS, especially when I'm not able to eat enough, which is most of the time. In addition to vomiting, nausea, stomach pains, acid reflux, burping, and all of that, I also have blood sugar lows, hypoglycemia, and I wasn't sure if it was related to my food, but I have noticed for a while that it's always two hours after I eat when I get my low blood sugars. I get really sweaty, really flushed, I get shaky. Sometimes I get dizzy and I almost always have to lay down. After I eat, sometimes I get uh, low blood pressure, which is interesting because usually my blood pressure is severely high. I have hypertension from hyperpots. So it is interesting that a couple hours after eating, I get low blood sugar and low blood pressure. Recently, my GI symptoms have affected me so much that I have been malnourished. I've been in the, in the ER a lot of times needing um, extra IV fluids. I'm on constant IV fluids, three liters a day, and I run them constantly when I'm in my vomiting flares, but that hasn't been enough, which is crazy. I've been vomiting so much that in the last month, I've had to go twice for extra IV fluids and for magnesium and potassium because my levels were critically low from all the vomiting and dehydration. So the test started the night before when I had to start being NPO, which means nothing per oral. I had no food or anything to drink other than a couple sips of water um, that night in the morning before my procedure. I was only able to take my most important medication, my heart medication, which is Corlinor, because that's something that I can't go without, but I wasn't able to take any of my other meds that morning, especially my stomach meds, because that could have change the results of the gastric emptying study. So I got to the hospital in the morning and we, we went into the nuclear medicine like area of the hospital. Um, it's like a, depart a part of the radiology department and they had me eat a small amount of oatmeal and it had a little bit of radioactive powder in it so that my food could be seen inside of my stomach in the scans. And I was supposed to eat like kind of quickly for me. They said to try to eat within 15 minutes, which for someone who has, you know, a lot of nausea and stomach pain is pretty difficult. So that was hard, but I was able to do it. And they gave me like a little bottle of water, like one of those small like kitty bottles. And I wasn't able to drink more than a couple sips. He said, drink as much of the water as you can, but I, I didn't want to throw up because I was starting to get really nauseous. And I was afraid if I kept drinking, I wouldn't be able to hold it down. So if I couldn't hold the food down, they wouldn't be able to do the test, which is why I had to reschedule the first time, you know, because I was in my cyclic vomiting. I was able to hold it down. Thankfully, my symptoms were not as bad as usual. And I don't know if it's because it was such a small amount and or because it was so bland, but it was, it, it went okay. It, I was nervous about having to lay down for hours after eating because I have such a hard time laying down after eating. I get really nauseated and I often don't keep my food down. So thankfully I was nauseous and my stomach was hurting, but I didn't throw up and I didn't have acid reflux. The pain was a bit more manageable than usual, which was good, but I was also nervous that that would mean the test results would be normal because it wasn't nearly as bad as it usually is for me. So I was in the machine and the scanner for a total of two hours and 25 minutes. I was in there for I think five or six scans total the first one took two hours straight that I had to sit still straight for two hours and it was not easy as someone who's claustrophobic but I did it I just you know focused on my breathing and just tried to meditate and think about happy thoughts there was one point where I felt my anxiety building up and I was like breathing and it wasn't really I felt like I wasn't able to manage it and I was getting like I've started to feel like I might have to stop the test 
and I called the tech and he was nice enough to let me, um, he brought my phone so I could play a little ASMR. He was like, you can listen to some music or anything that relaxes you. I was like, I'm gonna listen to ASMR because ASMR is very relaxing. It's the only way I can relax enough to sleep at night through my pain. I listen to ASMR every night. So that's what got me through my scans is listening to some whispering, which calmed me down and just really helped me get through the scan. I think if I didn't have that ASMR on my phone playing next to me, it would have been a lot harder to get through if I'm being honest, but I did it. And the total of the study took five hours. It was a lot of waiting in between because like I said, the first scan was two hours straight, but then after that, there were just five minutes each with about 30 minutes in between. So the results were not what I expected and they weren't good, <laughs> to, to put it bluntly. It turns out I have slowed or delayed gastric emptying as well as rapid gastric emptying. So I do have gastroparesis, but I also have dumping syndrome. Like what? I didn't know it was possible to have both. I have heard of both being common with POTS and EDS, which I have both, but I've never heard of anyone who had both at the same time. I'm honestly pretty baffled how that could even happen. I've done a lot of research on this and I found it is possible, but it's very rare. And it generally happens with diabetic patients. It makes sense because people with diabetes also have autonomic neuropathy or autonomic dysfunction, which is dysautonomia. And that's what POTS is. POTS is also a form of autonomic nervous system dysfunction. So that means the nerves in my body don't function properly. And all of the functions in my body, which are supposed to be automatic, like breathing, heart rate, blood pressure, vision, hearing, digestion, sweating, bladder control, all of that is affected by my pot. So it, it makes sense why I have gastroparesis and dumping syndrome. I'm just pretty baffled that I have both at the same time. I would never expect that. I would expect one or the other, but not both. And considering my symptoms weren't as bad that day, it makes me wonder what it would be like on a, on a day, like a normal day. Unless you see this for yourself, it's gonna be a little hard to understand. So I'm gonna put a little screenshot of my test results up here. All y'all know, I am very transparent. I share it all on this channel. So here we go. These were my results. So as you can see, within the first two hours, or at least the first 90 minutes, I only digest 10% of my food. So within 90 minutes, the average or healthy person with a normal working stomach digests over half of their food, or at least half, because in four hours, it takes that's like the average amount of time that it takes to digest a whole meal. So naturally, half of that time, two hours, half of the food should be digested, and I only digested 10% and it was a small meal, so that was pretty shocking. The fact that my stomach muscles are not contracting to move my stomach along shows that I have delayed gastric emptying or gastroparesis. However, the weird thing where it gets really odd is after two hours, my stomach switches up and starts rapidly digesting, which is also known as dumping. So dumping syndrome is where your food is digested too fast, which can cause a whole number of symptoms as well as gastroparesis, nausea, vomiting, stomach pains, the normal gastroparesis symptoms, but it also causes diarrhea in some people. For me, I have constipation. I rarely have diarrhea, but I do get that sometimes as well. And then it also causes problems with blood sugar and you know, like hypoglycemia, low blood sugars, and sweating, flushing, and low blood pressure. So that explains all of those symptoms for me. I thought it was like my POTS, hypoglycemia. Now we know why I have hypoglycemia and why my POTS is getting worse two hours after I eat. It's just so weird that it digests fast. I mean, like it's too slow and then too fast. I don't even know how that's possible. Like someone explain this to me. I know it's a problem with the nerves, but it's just, it's really confusing. And this makes the treatment much harder for me because the treatments that are helpful for gastroparesis are bad for dumping syndrome and vice versa. So it's going to be extra challenging as my gastric, as my gastroenterologist said, it's going to be very tough to manage. It's truly a catch-22 because like I said, the treatments that are available for gastroparesis, the standard treatments are 
you know, erythromycin and then Reglan. I can't take Reglan because it's a seizure trigger for me. It triggers my grand mal seizures, which are dangerous, so I cannot take Reglan. That's a big no for me. And then I, erythromycin is something that if I tried it, it would help the gastroparesis, but then it would make my dumping worse since it would speed up my motility. And same with all the other gastroparesis treatments, they're all centered around speeding up the motility, so it'll help me in one way and then it'll make my symptoms worse. And actually that makes sense why Mestinon made my vomiting and my stomach issues worse. I've been on Mestinon for a while for my POTS. It's supposed to help push the blood to my heart and my brain and my POTS. Although it was helpful a little bit for my POTS, we think it was making my stomach symptoms worse because since I started it, I've just gotten worse, lost a lot of weight, and then I stopped it and I was able to gain a couple of pounds and I'm still struggling a lot, but I'm not struggling as much. So we think that the Mestinon maybe made it made me worse because Mestinon is a muscle strengthener. And so it was probably strengthening the muscles in my stomach and helping my stomach contract my food, which was helping in the first two hours, but then it was making my dumping syndrome worse in the second um, two hours or like, you get what I'm saying. It was making me worse after two hours of eating. Now we know why. <laughs> so my GI is pretty awesome and she always comes up with a plan. So each month we come up with a plan for treating my symptoms. And then if the plan doesn't work, we have like a backup plan. So right now we are, the only thing on the table as of now for me is a gastric pacemaker, also known as a gastric electrical stimulator or a feeding tube. Now, neither of these options are ideal, obviously. Gastric pacemaker, for me, it would be more of a pacemaker because it wouldn't just stimulate, but it would slow down. It's basically the same thing that people use for their heart um, when they need to pace their heart correctly if their heart is too slow um, and or too fast. My heart is generally too fast, so a pacemaker wasn't ideal for my heart or POTS, but in this situation, my GI said I may be a good candidate for a gastric pacemaker. So the only thing though, I'm really, really hesitant to, you know, it is a, a it's surgically implanted into your stomach and it ele basically electrocutes your stomach muscles into contracting. Um, so I don't really know, I'm worried that it's gonna make my dumping syndrome worse, but more than that, I am concerned because it does have lead and I have had lead toxicity in the past. I've suffered from mold toxicity, lead toxicity, you know, Lyme disease, and all of that compounded and it just made me really, really sick. So I'm very hesitant to put more lead in my body since it's known to cause a lot of neurological symptoms and all kinds of systemic symptoms. It just does not make me feel comfortable to, to put something like that in my body. I already have a foreign object in my body from having my line. At least that's not lead. <laughs> so the pacemaker is something I'm going to be giving a lot of thought to. And my GI came up with a plan. Basically, I'm going to, she raised my dose for my amitriptyline because apparently amitriptyline also treats cyclic vomiting and gastroparesis since it's nerve related. and. The reason that I originally started taking amitriptyline is for my nerve damage. She thinks that could help, so hopefully that will help. And then I am taking all, obviously antiemetics, which are a hit or a miss, but they usually don't help for me. So unfortunately, she said if I lose any more weight or get any worse, I will have to have a feeding tube placed. So we originally were talking about TPN, which is IV nutrition, um, but she said that TPN long term is really risky because it can cause infections which can kill you. And I've already had sepsis and endocarditis, bacteremia, and it really just takes a toll on the body. So we don't want to put me in more risk of infections because I'm already at a risk of infection since I run my fluids every day. Um, apparently TPN raises your risk higher for infection more than just regular IV fluids. It's really hard on the veins. So she said a feeding tube, unfortunately, would be a better option for me since it might have to be long-term. She said we would start with an NJ tube, which would go in my nose and all the way down, bypassing my stomach to my intestines, to my jejunum technically, which is in the intestines. That sounds really unpleasant and we're gonna try to avoid that at all costs, but my, between my malnutrition, weight loss, and then all my symptoms, my pots getting worse, my fatigue, you know, I've been sleeping so much, I've been so foggy, and it's just been so hard for me to function, so. I am at the point that I I agreed that if I get any worse, I'll try the feeding tube. 
And then if the feeding tube helps, then we're gonna consider a more permanent feeding tube, like a surgical feeding tube. But hopefully I won't need that. Hopefully it'll just be temporary until I can gain some weight and get healthier and more stable. My GI did refer me to a nutritionist, but I haven't found one that works with my insurance. The one she referred me to is out of network. Luckily, I do know a lot about nutrition as it's one of my passions and it's something I thought about doing um, if I was able to go to school I would probably want to be a nutritionist so it's something I'm very passionate about anyway but it seems like no matter what I eat even if you know even just drinking hurts my stomach and makes me more nauseous so it's very difficult but I've been living with this for a long time so I know I'm gonna be okay I'm gonna keep on going and I'm just glad to finally have answers now, some solid answers that we know that there's something physically wrong with my stomach, which makes sense since it's related to the nerve damage, the EDS, the POTS. Gastroparesis and dumping syndrome are very common with both, both POTS and Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. And I have both hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos as well as vascular Ehlers-Danlos, so it makes sense. I'm just so happy to have answers, even though it's not the answers we were hoping for. To be honest, it took me a few days to process it, and I was, you know, there's a lot of tears and a lot of talking with God, but I know that this is going to be okay. This is, this means I can, you know, hopefully treat what I have better now that we know exactly what it is. I am a little frustrated that I didn't have this test done years ago since I've had this pretty much my whole life, and it's just gotten worse and worse over the last 10 years. You know, if when I was hospitalized two years ago, if they gave me the gastric emptying study in the hospital, I could have been in a different place today, but it is what it is. Everything happens the way it's meant to happen. So just grateful I have more solid answers now. And now we know that I have gastroparesis and dumping. So yeah, knowledge is power. So I'm just glad that I got that over and done with. And hopefully I can, gain a couple more pounds so I could avoid a feeding tube. I'm trying my best on the days or minutes that I'm able to eat. I eat as much as I can to try to compensate, but then I end up paying for it later. And as I'm sure most of you know, medical marijuana and CBD is very expensive. Otherwise, I would be much better able to manage my symptoms. If you made it this far in the video, please give it a like. That would help me out so much. And subscribe to my channel if you haven't already to see more videos on my chronic illness and to see videos about vegan, gluten-free food and all that jazz. So yeah, hit the bell, by the way, if you haven't already for notifications on when I post videos. And yeah, I love you guys to pieces. I'll see you next time. Bye. Oh, 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 oh,